Political turmoil in Washington. Could it bring U.S. congressional work to a standstill? Hello, I'm Arnold Nider, and this is The Heat. A bitterly divided Republican Party has the uphill task of electing a new Speaker of the House after Kevin McCarthy lost that job on Tuesday. The Republican congressman from California was dumped in a historic vote, marking the first time a Speaker has ever been voted out of the U.S. House of Representatives. Now lawmakers will reconvene next week with Republicans scrambling to elect someone new for the job. We begin with this report from CGTN's Nathan King. So after the drama, what next? What we do know is that Kevin McCarthy, the man who only lasted nine months in the speakership and was the first to be ousted as speaker from the floor, has essentially said he is not running again. I believe I can continue to fight, maybe in a different manner. I will not run for speaker again. I'll have the conference pick somebody else. So the question next is who will take his place? Well, there are going to be lots of names floating around, but first of all, focus on these two. We have Steve Scalise, the number two of McCarthy, the House Majority Leader, who has been calling conservatives for a long time. He's a Republican from Louisiana. Uh, he is very much part of the MAGA crowd, although he does at the moment uh, have cancer and going under treatment for that. That may be a problem. Also look at Jim Jordan. If anyone you look to the Benghazi hearings or the current impeachment inquiry, he is a flamethrower Republican congressman uh, from Ohio, very much part of the MAGA crowd. The question is for both these and anyone else who gets in the races, can they command all of the votes essentially in the Republican caucus? Remember, they have a majority of about four. They can only lose about uh, four votes. So it's going to be very, very difficult. There may be other contenders uh, coming along as well. But essentially, it's a, to use a, a metaphor, it's a bit like a doctor changing, but the patient not. And the patient has the same diseases, the same divisions in the Republican Party when it comes to cutting spending or aid for Ukraine, uh, the uh, same divisions when it comes to uh, uh, whether to support Donald Trump's MAGA wing of the party or be more moderate. A lot of Republicans have seats where Joe Biden uh, uh, won to become president. So it's very, very complicated indeed. And the trouble is, nothing can happen in the House of Representatives here behind me until a speaker is appointed. Now, it'll take about a week for them to coalesce behind a candidate. There'll be a, a, pri a private vote amongst the Republicans. Speaker, then it will go to the whole floor. You should imagine the Democrats opposing whatever their choice and trying to nominate their own minority leader, Hakeem Jeffries. That's formulaic. But it's going to be very, very difficult. Meanwhile, Ukraine aid is a big, big problem. The Pentagon say they have about $5 billion left, enough for a couple of months. They may be able to find a bit more money. And then, of course, remember, all this crisis started when Kevin McCarthy breached a deal with the Democrats to keep the government running, but only until November 17th. What if we don't get a speaker by then? What if the speaker isn't strong enough? Are we going to face the same problems? Are we going to face another government shutdown? This is really a huge problem. Essentially, American institutions encapsulated by the House of Representatives are still showing a very bad example on how to govern let alone keep the government working. Nathan King, CGTN on Capitol Hill. To discuss this and more, let's bring in our guests. Joining us here in Washington, D.C., Niambi Carter is an associate professor of public policy at the University of Maryland. Brian Becker is the executive director of the ANSWER Coalition in Delaware. Brendan Bryce is a columnist, media personality, and conservative talk show host of the Bryce is right. And Rena Shah is founder of Relax Strategies and a former Republican strategist. Welcome to all of you. Rena, it just took a few members of Kevin McCarthy's own party, along with the entire membership, of course, of the Democrat Party in the House of Representatives, to unseat him. Um, how significant is this development, and what does it tell us about the state of the Congressional Republican Party? 
Well, there were eight members who crossed over to vote with Democrats to lead to that ouster of Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who now feels very much as if, you know, he's like a private citizen now. That's not true. He's gone back to being a regular member of Congress. Uh, but it was tough to hear his concession speech. I mean, there was uh, there were high points, there were low points, but one thing he said is he has no regrets. And so for those eight Republicans that, again, um, ate their own, essentially, it remains yet to be seen how their party will treat them. Will they be uh, ostracized? It seems like, yes, that is the short answer, meaning will they be kicked out of the conference? That is a potential other option. There are moderate Republicans who sit in endangered seats, again, seats that Joe Biden won, that are very angry at these eight Republicans. But I submit to you that they are not all the same. They all had very different reasons for voting the way they did. For example, Congresswoman Nancy Mace, who has been looked at as a moderate through and through, uh, she voted to um, oust Kevin McCarthy because she said it's about trust. Now, of course, there, were, there was Congressman Tim Butcher from Tennessee. And he also said this was about spending, that this wasn't personal. This was about the very fact that they have an edict to go and curb Washington's appetite for our taxpayer dollar. And so he took that very seriously. And then, of course, there were some others. Congressman Matt Gates, of course, of Florida, leading the charge. And it did seem rather personal with him. Uh, but he's really been part of this group that, that has come together and been very critical of what the speaker promised when he took the speakership uh, back in January. And he says that Kevin McCarthy just did not deliver on things such as standalone spending bills, uh, right. those appropriations bills. And so here we sit in a most unique moment. But I will say this, Anand, I do feel that these sort of reports of the demise of the Republican Party are quite premature and quite overblown at this point. Okay, we shall see. Uh, Niambi Carter, President Biden has been co commenting on these latest developments. Let's listen to some of what he had to say. More than anything, we need to change the poisonous atmosphere in Washington. You know, we have strong disagreements, but we need to stop seeing each other as enemies. We need to talk to one another, listen to one another, work with one another, and we can do that. So, um, Niambi, is that a fair assessment by the president that these two parties, the two main parties in Congress, see each other as enemies? And if politics is about compromise, uh, is the system now in gridlock? Uh, permanently, uh, is it effectively broken? Well, listen, I think the ideal is that parties work together. And certainly there have been other moments where we've seen deep partisan divides, but I do think we are in a unique moment. Um, Pew just did a study not very long ago showing that Americans of different parties, of different ideologies, do see themselves as different, don't see themselves as having anything in common, and in fact, do not speak to each other. And I think that's where... Uh, we we saw on display this week where, um, you know, you had the Republican Party cannibalizing their own speaker, um, in part because of this bipartisanship that was displayed in this sort of Hail Mary to keep the government open. So I think it's not irretrievably broken. Um, but I do think that there has to be, I think, a rediscovery of what that middle ground can be and what does bipartisanship mean. I mean, by definition, it means sometimes you get what you want and sometimes I get what I want. I mean, that's pluralism at its finest. And if we can't agree to do that, um, then the whole project is really, you know, all for naught if we're not going to say, you know, this might not be the fight that I can have right now, but maybe um, on this thing we can agree to disagree and figure out something that we can we can do, something that we can compromise on. Um, and I know for some, compromise feels like failure, mm. uh, but I think that's what this whole experiment is about. I mean, this is sort of why the founders organized the government the way that they did, um, so that there would be a balance between small and large states, so that you would find um, places where sometimes you're in the majority, other times you're in that more minority, to curb this desire to always see uh, someone who may feel differently than you as your political enemy, because you understand that one day you might be in that seat. And so you certainly don't want to do anything or set poor precedents um, for how your uh, political opponent, or at this point, your colleague, when you're in that chamber, um, might treat you later. So I think compromise is sort of the ideal, but we are certainly, I think, in a dark valley, and it might be deep, and it might be long. Naomi, of course, this has been going on for some time now, the divisions that we see, the polarization. Do you see anyone in the leadership of either party 
uh, that could find that middle ground that you talk about? I mean, I think there are probably people in either party that would like to see themselves as centrist. But when you don't really have any political payoff, I think, to be a centrist, to look at someone who is conciliatory uh, to the other side, I don't know that there is a lot of place for that middle ground anymore. I think when we look at um, the public, you know, the citizenry, um, in some respects, this sort of um, appeal to the higher self is just not a winning strategy um, in in many cases. And so I think we are having to revise the right. whole playbook. And in some respects, we're expecting our leadership to be the leaders and show us what it can look like to disagree and do so in a more coherent and functional fashion. Brian Becker, at its core, this was about the budget. That's the money that the uh, government needs to run the country. Um, I mean, there were hardliners in the Republican Party in the run-up to this uh, vote that we saw in Congress, which expressed deep concerns over the government, the Biden administration, continuing to pour money into Ukraine. In fact, one of the Republican rebels, James Good, said, and this is, I'm quoting him here, he said, most of what Congress does is not good for the American people. Does he have a point? Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, even though there is great polarization in the country, uh, as your other guests have said, there there is some point of unity among the American people, which is they despise Congress, both those who vote for Republicans and those who vote for Trump. The approval rating of Congress is in the single digits. Uh, it's a despised institution. It's considered by most people to be irrelevant. Mostly what the Congress does is fight with itself. Uh, its only job really is either to declare war, it has the power to declare war, which it hasn't done since 1941, even though the U.S. has been involved in many wars. And the other power is the power of the purse. And here, mainly, the Congress is debating with itself about whether or not even the government can be funded, whether funds can be uh, authorized and appropriated. Uh, in terms of the Ukraine war funding, uh, it's very unpopular in the country. Uh, again, this, there's a very small read about this in the mainstream media. The mainstream media is functioning basically as an echo chamber for the military industrial complex and those who are cheerleading for this ridiculous war, a war that should end and could end uh, if the U.S. Uh, and Russia go back to the negotiating table. But yes, the American people don't want to spend hundreds of billions of dollars for a war that they don't really understand. Final point is that in the coming weeks, 70,000 child care centers, that's one third of all of the child care centers in the United States, are likely to go bankrupt because Congress has cut off COVID relief funds that kept uh, child care centers open starting in 2020. About a third of them were near bankruptcy then. So 3.2 million kids are about to lose child care. A lot of Americans are saying, why are we spending $40 billion more for missiles for death and destruction in Ukraine rather than negotiate when we have child care centers in record numbers being closed, when homelessness is growing? This is a problem for most people in America, but they don't have a voice in the mainstream media. Brandon Bryce, as uh, Brian points out, the country has serious needs itself. And when we look at the money that is going to Ukraine, I mean, and we look at the way uh, it's being talked about in Congress, could this current vote and what happens next seriously impact United States support for uh, Ukraine? And one other thing we have to look at, I mean, how will U.S. arms manufacturers and dealers respond to this? Because they are actually the main beneficiaries of this government largesse. Well, absolutely. I mean, right now you have a situation where, you know, the majority of Americans don't agree with the fact that we're sending billions to Ukraine. But the flip side is we've got infrastructure that's here that's still crumbling. Uh, we've got people who are still out of work amid COVID, you know, from, from COVID. And so right now I think the sentiment is that people are angry because they don't see a lot of the investment and focus being here as opposed to Ukraine, which is a place most Americans can't even tell you where it's on the map. But let me say this about the speaker. This speaker decision is pivotal because the next speaker literally could determine the, the, the impact of 2024, depending if you get a guy like Jim Jordan or if you get a guy like Scalise or if you get someone who's a wild card. You know, the one thing that I learned today is I had always thought that you had to be a member of Congress to be nominated as speaker, and you don't. And if you've seen some on the right the far right have said that, you know what, 
maybe they need it's time for the former president 45 to be put back into or to be put into the speaker's seat this is a pivotal time but i can tell you right now this when you talk about compromise i think that is the number one thing here is this vote wasn't about uh the fact that mccarthy uh was out of touch this is the fact that this was a speaker who did not have control of his own party and furthermore Compromise is how things get done in Washington. You know, the things that Newt Gingrich and even Nancy Pelosi was able to get done. Never in a million years would anyone have challenged Newt or Nancy Pelosi. So this was about respect and about the fact that compromise didn't seal the deal. And this possibly could be the end of moderate uh, politicians in Washington. We know, of course, these rumors have been swirling around that former President Donald Trump uh, will be nominated for that speaker position. But if the Republican Party's intention is to unite the party, what does the former president bring to it? Well, first of all, there is a, a rather obscure rule within the House Republican Conference's rules itself, and then also on the House Rules Committee that uh, preclude a person who has been formally charged with a felony uh, or any other type of, I, I can't remember the exact language, or basically formally charged with a crime uh, to, from serving in leadership. So uh, there goes that sort of bid for, for Trump to become Speaker of the House. Oh. I think this could be a really unique moment uh, because we are in uncharted territory. Yeah. This is historic in a way that we just cannot overstate. Uh, never before has a, a sitting Speaker of the House been removed. This kind of vote hadn't even come to the floor in over 100 years. I'm a creature of the House. I've served two Republican members of Congress as a senior staffer, and I was shocked. But maybe, just maybe, this was a shock to the, the system needed. Mm -hmm. And this could be a reckoning that allows the Republicans to go back, take the next few days to cool off, come back next week, and unify. Because that's one thing it seems like the, uh, the Democrats have going for them. We didn't really know what Hakeem Jeffries would be like when Nancy Pelosi tapped him. But my, oh my, during those 15 ballots, and fast forward to now, uh, he has just been incredible, a steady hand, a unifier. And I think Republicans should take note of that. Um, they need to not only have trust in their next speaker, but their next speaker shouldn't have to make so many concessions. It's been said before that a centrist cannot succeed in this role, given how McCarthy was booted, Speaker Ryan left, pushed into early retirement, if you will, and also Speaker John Boehner left. Mm -hmm. These were all sort of moderate types that didn't want to deal with the populist forces that toppled some of their colleagues in their elections. And so what we see right now is not the clown car fully in control because that's what a lot of people are getting wrong right now they're saying this is the MAGA faction of the Republican Party at work these are all folks like Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene from Georgia who's been extreme right-wing figure uh, she wasn't part of the vote to get rid of McCarthy yesterday these were eight people who again as I said before had their <laughs> own reasons and so therefore this represents a unique opportunity for Republicans to say you know what maybe we need to audit ourselves maybe we need to figure out what we can do and select somebody like Steve Scalise, who is very much a creature of the House, who has extreme loyalty from his staff. Yeah. I've watched him nearly 15 years, 20 years now, and he is a guy who commands a great deal of respect from moderates and even more right-wing figures. I think he could be a really potentially good one. I'm not fully sure yet. He's not really a moderate anymore, but you need to have a loyal operation around you to whip votes. That does help you as a speaker if you're able to augment a formal whipping operation with, again, loyalists who surround you. Naomi, when we look at uh, the budget and the mechanics of how Congress works, uh, we see that these enormous omnibus bills that are presented to the House of Representatives are often uh, filled with unrelated expenditure. They just snucked in. They are often referred to as pork. And as Brian pointed out earlier, uh, there are needs in this country, 3.2 million children at risk. Child poverty is rising in the country, and as Brandon pointed out, uh, infrastructure is crumbling. I mean, the manner in which things are done in Congress, does that need to be reformed? Perhaps. I mean, I think when we talk about budgets, we often talk about dollars. But I think what Brian and what others are talking about is when we talk about budget, it's telling us who we think we are, who our priorities are are, what matters to us. And when we talk about cutting things like Medicare and when we talk about cutting ch funding for child care, um, even Ukraine for some, um, we are talking about what we think matters here. And I think when we um, 
talk strictly about this as if these are just dollars and cents, we miss the human aspects of what budgeting actually is. It's, it's in some ways an ethical moral document. And so I think there's a lot of hand-wringing often about really programs that don't really cost a lot when you think about what's part of the overall budget. The amounts that we spend on things like national defense and security, I don't think anybody would say those are unimportant things, but that's a, a large portion of our budget. Yet when we talk about social welfare spending, something that can be deeply unpopular, then it's like, well, get rid of it because, mm -hmm. you know, we don't have enough for this. But we can always shake the cushions and find money for the things that we care about. And so I think when we talk about this budget, uh, or even even reforming the budget process, I think it would help to inject a little bit more of the humanity into this and not just treat everything like, oh, well, this is about balancing this or balancing that. It's about priorities. And ultimately, it's about people. Infrastructure is a part of caring about people. When the, the highway in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania went out this summer, that was a real danger. And it not only a real and a real inconvenience, but it also showed how much we have to do in this country, not just with our roadways and our bridges, but our train systems, our airline systems, right? Like we have a lot of work to do here. Yeah. But again, it's about what we value. And we show that when we show the line item in the budget. Brian, um, of course, you, United States television screens and newspapers are filled with details of the drama that is unfolding. But when we look at what is going on, does it actually change anything for ordinary people on the ground here in the United States, or for that matter, people at the receiving end of United States bombs around the world? I mean, if we look at some of the core issues, like more money for the military, um, endless wars, the corporate buyout of politicians, both parties are almost in full agreement on that. Yeah, there's a shocking degree of unanimity when it comes to the so-called defense budget. You know, until 1947, the country truthfully called the that budget the war budget because it was for war. But starting in 1950, we created what we all call now the military-industrial complex, which is a permanent war machine. It, the U.S. spends uh, like it's at war even when it's at peace, even though it's only rarely actually at peace. So you have this situation where the defense language, the language of defense is used pretextually to mm -hmm. sell the American people on the need to have 800 military installations, bases around the world, 1.7 million soldiers deployed around the world, uh, the revamping and, and, and building a new generation of nuclear weapons. We've spent $12 trillion on nuclear weapons since 1942. They've been used twice in 1945, and yet the U.S. keeps spending and spending and spending. The American people really are fed up with this. They may not be able to fully articulate their feelings in, in terms of what the problem is, but they don't think the government is working for them. And the reality is it's not working for them. Do the American people want endless war? Well, just ask this question. If Joe Biden actually sent Americans to fight in Ukraine against Russia, you know, the, what, what would be the reaction of the American people? I think demonstrations in the hundreds of thousands would take place, but instead we're fighting a proxy war. Other people are doing all the bleeding and dying. The military industrial complex gets richer and richer, yeah. and the American people are actually getting poorer because we are paying for it. Yeah. Rena, um, politically speaking, is this a bit of a shot in the foot for the Republican Party? I mean, will they be seen by the public as being a disunited party that really is incapable of doing the people's work? Well, I do think McCarthy's wound is self-inflicted, and he can blame a razor-thin majority all he wants. Uh, but look, Nancy Pelosi, uh, just prior to him, was able to get done what he couldn't do. And so it's been said in many ways, uh, in many times, in many ways, that she made the job look easy, because it certainly isn't. Uh, but also, you know, there are Republicans who say that this is an unproductive moment. And so you have Kevin McCarthy also shifting blame to Congressman Gates and, again, the MAGA faction of the party. Yeah. But like I said, I think he is the one to blame. He lost the trust. He didn't keep his promises. And he kind of kept business as usual going in Washington. Yeah. And so that is the point point here is how much are we going to allow Washington to continue to bloat itself and to do so with our taxpayer dollar before right. we need actual blow up of the system. I'm not saying it's unhealthy to have a, a blow up, but I'm saying it's not not healthy. And so yeah. this is a moment where we have to back up and say, um, look, 
there are going to be adults in the room. There is going to be a speaker chosen. I think next week, uh, I expect the GOP conference to unify because they understand that this is egg on the face of Republicans yeah. as we get up, as we lead into a very pivotal year. And so we don't need that. The party d certainly isn't getting any favors from this. Yeah. But also, let's not forget what's on the line, which is our taxpayer dollar. And that is the bottom line. Okay. So maybe Congress needs to check itself some more. Ronan Bryce, what are your thoughts on what happens next, especially in terms of who becomes the next Speaker of the House? Uh, as Rena pointed out, it would have to be someone that can unite the party, bring that conference together. You know, it, I was thinking about this. It's got to be somebody who uh, has the trust of their colleagues. But, it, you know, I, I, if I had to guess, I would say Scalise probably goes to the top. This guy literally took a bullet for the party. Uh, this is a guy who has shown that he can lead. Uh, he has the respect of his colleagues, even those colleagues that voted against uh, his, his uh, McCarthy. But also, you know, you've got to look at, again, whoever it is, this decision needs to happen quickly because 2024 is right around the corner. And the challenge, and I think this, you know, I'll say this as someone who uh, has been pretty, pretty, pretty centrist myself, mm -hmm. the next speaker literally will determine the future of the Republican Party in 2024. And if it's the wrong person, uh, this could be a get out of jail free card for the president. Okay, and that is where we have to leave it. Thank you to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C.